welcome to Conversations on Sustainability, brought to you by the Department of Recreation and Tourism Management at Vancouver Island University and the World Leisure Centre of Excellence at VIU. Good morning everyone and welcome to the second session of Conversations on Sustainability. Today I'm joined by uh, Janae B. Funk, a recreation therapist in Chilliwack. Tell us a little bit about the path to what got you to where you are now. Um, yeah, for sure. As I get older, I realize that path is really long. Um, <laughs> so my early, early days uh, started sort of in summer camps, um, organization called Junior Forest Wardens. That, that's where we met and um, worked through summer camps and decided that I wanted to go into outdoor rec. So I did the outdoor rec management diploma at what was then Capilano College yep. um, and after that two-year diploma went into working in the field so did things like uh, teaching cross-country skiing um, I was the a park interpreter at Alice Lake Provincial Park for a few years um, taught outdoor rec in Edmonton in the Catholic School Board um, kind of realized after <clears throat> five or six maybe seven years that seasonal work was great sometimes because it offered the opportunity to travel in the shoulder seasons um but not really great if you wanted to make a lot more money which i didn't really want to but i just felt like it was time for me to move in a different direction uh, so i always had wanted to work at easter seal summer camp and I did that in Squamish for one year. Uh, and the light bulb went on for me. And I went to uh, my boss and I said, how can I sustain this? Or how can I continue doing this throughout the year? And he said, well, have you ever thought of being an educational assistant? So I said, no. So I went into the school district and did that educational assistant position for a year. Loved it. Um, loved working with the youth that I was working with wasn't so fond of the politics involved in the school system so I decided that I needed some further education um, and went in did my degree at University of Waterloo and I got a Bachelor of Arts in Therapeutic Recreation and that was a three-year degree for me because I was able to port my yep. credits from Outdoor Rec and um, had always from that point throughout my whole university uh, was focused sort of on working with people with physical disabilities. Uh, mental health had never really crossed my mind, but there I was at the end of my degree needing to do an internship. Um, the one I had my heart set on didn't pan out, which is meant to be. Um, and I ended up at a residential treatment facility in Georgia. Um, just outside of Atlanta and I worked with uh, juvenile sex offenders and that was sort of my jumping in the deep end of uh, working in mental health. So I um, did that for uh, my internship and then when I, sorry, so that was four months and then after my internship came back to Canada, I uh, decided that I really wanted to um, have the ability to work in the states because at that point therapeutic rec was sort of just coming um into sort of degree status in british columbia mm -hmm. uh, but most of the therapeutic rec at that time was in geriatrics and i wasn't really keen on going into geriatrics so i ended up at another residential treatment facility in los angeles and i lived there for a year and worked there for a year um, but ended up coming back to Canada and got a position at the forensic psychiatry. So some people call it Colony Farm, um, forensic psych hospital. And I did that for a year and realized I didn't really want to be a casual. I wanted to, you know, I had this degree. I wanted to utilize it. I wanted to be paid accordingly and sort of offered that recognition, I guess, at that point I needed that. So they were opening the adolescent, sorry, yeah, adolescent psychiatry unit at the Kelowna General Hospital. So I 
moved there and sort of started the rec therapy program there and worked there for five years. Decided I really was not in love with Kelowna and wanted to come back to the coast. So I ended up working at the adolescent day treatment program at the Abbotsford Regional Hospital. It's no longer in that uh, building. It's at a different building. Um, and yeah, so I worked there for, I think, three or four years. And that politics that I talked about in the school system was very, very much in the health authorities. Um, and I, I just felt like I wanted to work with people sort of farther along the continuum of wellness. Um, I was, you know, I'd gone from working with people in crisis, getting them stabilized. I really wanted to work in with people that were in the community a little bit farther along the con wellness continuum. So I decided at that point to start my own company. Um, so I do contract work. Right now, working, uh, most of my contracts are through the distance learning schools. So it's kids that are homeschooled uh, and then they have special needs. So I go into their home, although not right now because of COVID, but go into their home and work with them. But um, building a relationship of trust so that I can help them be in the community and functioning in the community. Okay. So that's sort of where I'm at now your path yeah um and i remember when you were making that transition from working in the health authority to um doing some upskilling training and, and opening your own business and and the the stress of that um but it, the overall uh personal health and wellness goals that came with that as well absolutely yeah it was um i was quite anxious sort of going through my own mental health thing at that time and there was a lot of pieces, but just not happy in work and wanting to be happier at home and knowing that work affected that happiness at home. So making that what felt like, and it was a giant leap at that time yeah. <laughs> and just hoping that I landed on my feet. So, yeah. Which you have and then some. Um, so I'm wondering how you view sustainability. When I hear the word sustainability, I immediately go to my forestry background um, and I think about the forest and environmental sustainability. And we know that that's in the news, you know, headlines every day. Um, but for me, when I think of the word, I think of the keeping going, the, let, the being able to keep going. Um, and utilizing resources along the way but and hoping that the resources are there to utilize um, and it, there's so many it's not just forestry it's not just the environment it's so there's so it's such a broad you know broad term mm -hmm. uh, when I think about it in my I thought a little bit about it in terms of my work and I just think about the the mental wellness of people and being able to, you know, I, I have seen the journey of some of the students that I've worked with. Um, you know, I started working with them when they were 12 and 13 mm -hmm. and now they're adults living in the community. Um, and to see that transition of them literally not being able to get out of their bedroom to now holding managerial positions in the community is quite fantastic. Um, but the, and to me, sustainability is that, you know, that building of the, the skills throughout over time and building the resources for them to rely on in order to function well in society where they are now. Yeah. So really taking the approach of, of that sort of social sustainability and, and helping individuals achieve, um, you know, I, I sound very Oprah when I say this, but very their best selves, um, but, but really their, their ability to, to gain um, a level of independence that they wouldn't necessarily have had beforehand. Um, I'm going to back it up a little bit because I realized I probably should ask this question first. Um, what 
is therapeutic recreation and um, how does that relate to leisure education? Okay. Um, oh my gosh, this is the question. And I should have a, a box answer for my, oh, this is therapeutic recreation. Um, when I talk about therapeutic recreation, I usually, and some people would cringe that I do this, I usually bring in the OTs and the you know physio because people know what those are. If you've heard of an occupational therapist, you've heard of a physiotherapist, people are like, well, what's a recreational therapist? So we, we do work closely with other disciplines. We, um, occupational therapy looks at sort of the activities of daily living. So all of the activities that you do from getting out of bed, um, you know, being able to function to get out of bed, get out of the house, um, and then, you know, and everything in between. Uh, leisure being part of that. As a recreation therapist, I look solely at the leisure lifestyle of people. Um, we do assessments, we do, uh, we look at people's interests, um, and we try and build their leisure repertoire uh, so that they can participate in leisure and increase their wellness. Um, so, and I, I always think of it as the infinity symbol where we are creating a leisure lifestyle for them, finding activities for them to do. Um, but while we're doing that, we're doing the leisure and they're increasing their wellness. So it's, um, and through that, they might want to try something else that's a little bit more daring or just different or have that, um, the courage or the confidence to do that. So increasing well-being through um, participation in leisure, but also increasing increasing their leisure repertoire. So would it be would it be a fair assessment to say that that um, recreation therapy is um, the use of recreation to achieve a therapeutic outcome? Absolutely. Um, which could be you know independence, um, you know social emotional growth, um, and strengthening, but that it's it's not it's it's not what we would imagine in the sense of therapy of sitting on the couch and paying lucy or five cents it's it's yeah. actually achieved through that that intentional leisure participation that's right yeah and we do when i so when i meet with a client now um i usually meet with them a couple of times before i do a formal assessment and then very often the teachers will say uh, well i need their goals and it's like okay I've only met with them once. I'm not going to have goals for you yet. So usually I'll meet with them three or four times. And then very often I will include them in the creation of the therapeutic goals. It's like, do you want to work towards this? How about this? Some of them, they're like, uh -uh. and I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> we're putting it on there. You might not want to, but you know, once that, you know, once you get to that comfort level. Um, but yes, definitely working towards therapeutic goals throughout the whole process. Okay, another thing that gets bandied about around is the idea of leisure education. And I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit of an insight on what that is. So leisure education, it is exactly that, learning, <laughs> learning about leisure. No, um, so I often think of, um, when I think about leisure education and explaining it, I think about young men young men that are, you know, the adrenaline junkie, go for it. I'm going to ski. I'm going to skateboard. I'm going to surf, do all that stuff. And then God forbid, but they come into, they have a horrific accident and lose the use of their legs. Okay. So everything that they had done traditionally, yes, you can absolutely do all those things without the use of your legs, but you have to have that adaptation. Um, but what I try and think about is, okay, at this point, those things are not available to you. What's available to you? And let's look at what your values are. Let's look at what you value in your life, what your interests are. So discovering interests, I think, is a great thing um, so that people have options that they can go to. Um, so that, so let's say, you know, one, uh, one person, 
all they do is they like to golf. Well, you can't golf right now because of an injury or because of the weather or for whatever reason. Um, what, what else is available to you? Well, I don't know. I just like to golf. It's like, okay, so let's explore what perhaps you did in your life previously and just, um, and there are, there are assessments again to do uh, and lots of worksheets exploring values and, and looking at what people like to do in the past and perhaps let's maybe bring some of that back or have you tried this option? So just trying to expand people's knowledge of leisure and their, their leisure base. If that makes sense. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now, what role do you think uh, therapeutic recreation plays in, in overall sustainability and, and achieving um, sustainable communities and, and sustainable life? What role rec therapy plays? Mm -hmm. Ooh, well, I think with my role right now um, and just helping people become functioning members of society. Um, <laughs> I keep thinking of the infinity picture again, and it's that are the resources available in the community? Uh, and I'm talking about rec therapy, but I'm also talking about other social supports, um, you know, safe places for people to go or counseling, uh, healthcare, um, access to healthcare all those things are those in place. Um, and rec therapy I see is sort of a, a part of that. Yeah. Um, sometimes I, I see those as sort of the crisis. Um, mm -hmm. Although they're ongoing, very often people will utilize those things in a crisis. Rec therapy is sort of, okay, let's, let's look long term. So let's look at what can you do to stay healthy and well mm. over a long-term period and helping people get to that point. That makes sense. Yeah. It, it does. And, and I think that, you know, when we're in this, it, it, I mean, the pandemic has highlighted so many different things. Um, and I think one of the things it's, it's really highlighted is um, what do you do when a crisis doesn't go away quickly? Um, we're used to short-term emergencies, not longer-term emergencies, um, or an emergency that has no end, right? Um, and, and and that's a bit of a, a bit of a challenge. And and I think that when you're the way you're sort of positioning rec therapy as as sort of a suite of community services that are offered, you know, it, again, it comes back to that social sustainability piece and and providing the services to all citizens that need them. Um, and particularly those who need that sort of that little bit of a, a hand up um, mm -hmm. in in that whole process. And um, rec, rec therapy, one thing that COVID has shown me is rec therapy can be used with anyone can use rec therapy, like or the services of a rec therapist. It doesn't have to be someone who's had an accident and no longer has the use of their legs or can't get out of their bedroom. I mean, it could be uh, someone who's retiring and. I mean, in this COVID time, definitely <laughs> when we're all stuck in our house, it's like, okay, what can we do? It's like, mm -hmm. so that's that. Here's some options. That's actually a big part of you. You've sort of led into a big part of the conversation that my colleagues and I have been having um, at various points. And, and it's really looking at um, the specialization in leisure activities. And, and from when we were kids to, um, and, and yes, we were born in the 70s and raised in the 80s. Um, this uh -huh. is the lowest our bangs have been in, in decades, really. <laughs> um, yeah. the, uh, actually, I think both of us had no longer had bangs just because of the trauma of the 80s and into the early 90s. Oh, yes. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> big, big height. Um, but I, I think that, you know, we were raised with having really broad leisure repertoires. Um, very much music, dance, sports. Uh, both of us were really into the outdoors, um, and, and so having that broad spectrum. Um, you know, I, I know that you're a knitter. Um, you know, I'm a, a crafter. Both of us do photography, and so when these sorts of situations hit, we have that repertoire to to, to dig into. Um, 
where, what, I, what we're seeing now, what we've been talking about at the department is that specialization, major specialization becoming narrower and narrower. And in many um, segments, it's so heavily dependent on public facilities. Um, so thinking about that, and, and I know you have, because we've had these conversations, I'm wondering how you think leisure education can be brought in sort of into the mainstream um, and if you, you know, if you were um, the head of the school board system or the head of public recreation, how would you see using leisure education sort of to achieve some of that, that community level social sustainability? I think it would be an amazing program to have in the schools, um, not necessarily as part of physical education, because very often people will see rec therapy as part of physical education, but having it in a um, I think there, I think the, the term they use is career and personal planning mm -hmm. and everyone is uh, mandated to have that course. And I'm like, I would love to see rec therapy and leisure education within that course, a segment of it, um, mm -hmm. and run by a rec therapist. I think in, um, the facility, the rec facilities here, it would be such a wonderful program to have as a, I'm going to call it an introduction to rec, not rec therapy, but introduction to recreation and showing people that they do have options and that, oh, here are some of the services we offer within that. And, oh, here you can go and do this, not necessarily within our facility, but I think facilities, the public uh, parks and rec facilities have there's so much um, room for growth um, in the types of programming that they offer. Very often people, and I've seen this over and over again with the people that I work with, very often people think of Parks and Rec as sports. Mm -hmm. So we've got swimming, we've got the gym, and we've got soccer. Um, and it's like, okay but not everyone and i'm gonna do this me included i'm not a sports oriented person i would like to see things like a knitting class and when i say knitting class i very much view knitting as my social circle right now um and that social connection so offering different things where people can connect through leisure but also in that social capacity um, and I think once you build that, those social connections, I think people will be more likely to utilize the parks, uh, the rec centers, um, which in turn will make them more sustainable because they will, they will have a, um, a broader base of people utilizing their programs and someone who wouldn't have ever gone to the rec center now is going because there's, I'm going to just use knitting again as a knitting class and Oh, Oh, I see that pool. Oh, it looks really nice. I've never seen it before. Maybe I'll go swimming on the weekend with my kids. Or So just that, um, the integration of services that, um, if they broaden their services, uh, yeah. yeah. So, well, and I think the other thing that you're speaking to for me is, is also when you offer a diversity in programming, you also bring in a diverse group of people, which ultimately builds um, social capital bonds throughout your community, which, which ultimately makes your community more resilient, which is a, yes. a, a, a key element of, of sustainability as well. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, so we've been touching on the, the COVID crisis um, and, um, I know that's particularly challenging um, for you in, in managing that. Um, uh, J Janae's husband has an, uh, an autoimmune disorder, um, so is immune com compromised. Um, and because of the risks to him, you are, you are um, homeschooling your 13 year old daughter. And well, I love <laughs> trying to. <laughs> I, go, I love my niece dearly. Yeah, there is challenges there. Um, and, and so I'm wondering if you could speak from a, from a rec therapy lens, using your own family as a bit of a case study, um, as to where do you see the gaps in the system? During COVID, you mean? Yeah, during, during this type of crisis, yeah. 
Well, one of, um, so, yeah. so <laughs> oh my, where do I start? <laughs> Anywhere you want to. So not being able to go out because there are people that don't feel the need to social distance, don't feel the need to wear a mask. Well, we don't have a choice. We have to. Um, so our, <laughs> I'm going to say the, the resources that we're able to utilize have shrunk so much. So, you know, we used to go swimming at the pool, not available right now. Um, we're doing a lot of walking outdoors. That's probably our biggest thing. Um, we used to go to the odd movie. Obviously, those that's not available right now. Um, so just finding different ways to do those things. So we'll do, you know, movie night. <laughs> um, we shut off all the lights, shut the curtains. My daughter puts the fairy lights so it looks like the aisle into the living room and we make popcorn. And so just um, adapting, I guess. Um, yeah, so it's it's very, very much limited our public consumption of recreation. And um, as I know it has with so many people. Um, it, where my work is concerned, again, so unbelievably limited because my goal is to get these kids out of the homes and into the community doing things that they might not do um, independently. Um, but if they have, you know, a friend to go with them and sort of introduce them, I'm going to say let's for swimming. Um, once again, not an option. And because of the social distancing aspect, I can't have students in my vehicle. Um, so there's a lot of let's go for a walk in the neighborhood. Let's explore your neighborhood that way. Uh, doing little activities sort of along the way. So it seems like it's not just a walk. Um, yeah, it's very, very, very limiting. Um, mm -hmm. But trying to, and I'm so thankful that I have the rec therapy background, that I can sort of adapt things as we go. Um, activities and yeah, yeah. Very limiting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and we do yeah. have... Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, I think we're all we're all finding that. And, and I know it, it's really magnified in, in your household, but I mean, your household is really just a case of, of many, many other households. Um, and I, I always think of, I actually, I quite idolize Dr. Henry. Um, but, you know, I, I think of, of her, her sort of direction to us, the, the be kind, be calm, be safe. Um, and, and, you know, recognizing that there are some people who have it off so much worse than, than some of the rest of us. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, absolutely. Be kind, be calm, be safe. Yeah. And we're all in this together and it's doesn't look like it's going away very soon. So yeah. yeah. I, I'm going to switch gears to the other public health crisis that we have in BC right now, which would be the opioid crisis. And, and, um, this is a conversation I, I've been having with a number of my students um, who are, you know, examining this issue and, and, and definitely the magnification and the, the, the impacts of COVID on that, that crisis as well. And, and, you know, really speaking of, of this being a, a, you know, a time in our society where we really need to take a, a, a really deep look at our biases and judgments um, for individuals and how much empathy we have. Um, I'm wondering um, what you think the role of, you know, therapeutic recreation would be in assisting with uh, dealing with the, the opioid crisis and, and the associated homelessness with that. I, oh, this is a, I think, I, when I think of the word crisis, I think of what what is underlying what came before the crisis right mm -hmm. um and yes we are in a crisis and there are far too many people dying far too many um and do we need to address it 
absolutely. Um, I, I just keep thinking of, you know, Gabor Mate. I'm not an expert on, but everything he says just resonates on some level with me. Um, and I think the crisis absolutely needs to be addressed. I worry, and I think one of the things I saw in the healthcare system was it, f and I, I don't, I, um, I almost don't want to say this because what those workers do and what those doctors and nurses and everyone that's around that do is so unbelievably important. And I don't want to, this to sound like it's belittling that because it's not, it is so, so needed. And they're angels on this earth, but it sometimes feels like it's the band aid, mm -hmm. and, and we can't just keep, putting the band-aid on. We need to address why we're having this crisis. That's why I think about Gabor Mate and I think about the, the trauma that so many people have um, experienced throughout their life, mm -hmm. uh, be it in childhood, adulthood, and the resulting using of substances and then farther along the resulting addiction to those substances. Um, and I think that's what we see as a society. We see that, you know, we see the pictures of the people, or we walk past them, the pictures of the people on the street. We see the paraphernalia as, you know, we're walking down the sidewalk. Um, and I think that is um, the, it, that is the result of what's happening before. I know that sounds really silly, but of what's happening before that trauma. So I think as a, as from the perspective of a rec therapist, I think we can assist sort of all along the continuum of that. But I think um, helping people overcome that trauma in healthy ways um, I don't have the answer to that, but being in some part of that, um, because it's a uh, being making sure that the the societal resources are there, the social resources are there for people that want to explore that trauma, and I'm going to say purge it because that's the word that's coming to my mind. It's a scary, 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 scary place to have to be able to face that trauma hence the turning to the drugs yeah and i think you've really raised that the the issue that we we often think of of the drug use and the homelessness um as as the the wicked problem um but really we need to step it back and figure out what's the root cause of that and and um if i'm if i'm understanding you correctly um gabor mate's work it really suggests that it is the underlying trauma that we're trying to numb um, through Absolutely. drugs that leads us to the addictions. Absolutely, yeah. And addressing that trauma will hopefully, you know, cut that off, cut off the, I need to numb this. Um, yeah. On the, on the other end of it, through um, the recovery, uh, rec therapy, I can see being very much useful is that when people are consumed with getting money to buy drugs to do drugs and then once the drugs have worn off getting money to get drugs to buy drugs uh when someone has no you know has detoxed from that mm -hmm. now they have all this time and they have you know, they don't have to worry about, oh, I need money to get drugs, to buy drugs, to do drugs. And so being able, that's the leisure education piece coming in, um, helping them explore what their interests were, um, what their interests are now, or what, you know, they might want to try and being able to facilitate um, opportunities for them to try thing, new things. Yeah. Very often their social circle is um, people that use well okay so now if you go back to that you're going to perhaps you know 
go back to using. So building a new social circle, building other um, people that they can yeah. be around and be healthy with. So yeah. there's sort of, I see right therapy sort of in the, in the beginning, helping with the trauma and at sort of the other side within the crisis, there probably is a place for rec therapy. Um, I don't know what that is offhand. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think one of the, I know one of the things that when we look at, um, uh, individual or individuals who are type A behavior pattern and they're, but they're recovering from major crises, um, like a heart attack or something like that. One of the things they're, they're reluctant to do is, is turn them into or turn them onto physical activity, um, as, as a, a sort of a health outcome or health outlet, health outlet. We'll see if I can yeah. speak today. Um, because they, they take that, that incredible focus that they, they brought to other aspects of their life and they put it on there and it, and it, and it you know, anything can become unhealthy, even if it's a, a you know, a quote unquote healthy behavior, like physical activity can be. Um, and so I think there's, there's places like that in, in the addiction cycle that you'd want to avoid. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, looking at that, and, and I think it comes back to your, one of your original comments around where does it fit in the school system? Um, because we know that, um, I mean, the research shows us that mental health um, challenges really show up in early adulthood. Um, and so which speaks to the need for, you know, uh, not just campus recreation and intramurals at the university level, but, I, I, you know, a, a rec therapy, uh, leisure education kind of component to that at the university level, but also backing it up into the public school system. Um, and I would, and I'd, I'd like your opinion on this. I think we've been so focused on the physical activity and obesity and making sure that, you know, people are getting in their, their movement steps that we have forgotten that there are benefits to many other forms of, of leisure. Um, and that physical health is only one component. Um, and often when you have poor mental health, you have poor physical health. Um, thoughts on those statements? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and like I said, I'm going to go back to knitting <laughs> just because when, um, I joined a group, um, we, before COVID we met every, you know, Monday night at Starbucks and I, the whole week I looked forward to that social connection. And yes, we were just sitting there, we were creating, you know, it wasn't physical, but that social connection was so important to me. Um, I, I think, a lot of times when the focus is on the physical activities and the getting moving, while that is extremely important, it's not all there is. Um, and I think, you know, you and I experienced this when we were in Waterloo, um, is the, the lack of, I'm going to say social connection, even though we had our classmates and our colleagues, it was it, that, deeper social connection was there, or sorry, was, was missing at some points. And, um, you know, I think about the spirituality. Some people have, you know, the religion and they go to whichever church or temple or, um, and that, so there's that connection as well. Um, so bringing in so many different pieces, the physical, the spiritual, the, the emotional well-being, that social piece is just, um, it's such a layer. There's so many layers to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and definitely, I think in university, it would be so beneficial to give students opportunities to connect other than in a physical, because not all of them will be physical. Um, just because so many of them are away from home. And I know it's different this year with COVID. Um, but so many of them are away from home. So it's like, oh, I'm in this strange city. I don't really know anyone. Um, I like to do this, but is this available? Like a photography club or, you know, a book club or just a knitting club or what, whatever. Um, badminton, pickleball, just different options. So I think that's really, really important for um staff at universities, staff in the school systems to 
I think one, have that education. I know it comes down very often to funding, mm -hmm. um, but just to have that education that I, I think of myself personally in high school, um, like I said before, I was not a sports minded person. And if I had had a teacher that um, observed that I did ballet five days a week, I went backpacking and canoeing on the weekends, but I never got credit for that. That was a long time ago. I think it's a bit different now, but I never got credit for that. I never got acknowledged for doing those things that fed my soul that were physical, you know, and it's, so I think the, um, the administrators and the, the rec deliverers need to be educated as well, that there is more to recreation than organized sports. There's so much more, it's such a, such a broad, and just being made aware that there's that broad, the, the amount of activities that people can do. Excellent. Um, thank you so much for your time today. It's You're welcome. Been, it's been, uh, we don't have these conversations normally, so uh, <laughs> it's, no. it, it's, it's been really enjoyable to have the conversation and, and to, to have this conversation about sustainability um, with, with someone who, you know, maybe it's not the top of mind. Um, and, but, but ultimately what you do is so important to our communities and, and helping other citizens. And, and, and I think that, the, you know, one of the things we haven't really discussed about, and, and we don't need to today, but, um, I think one of the other thing that's really core to your practice is, is how much you introduce people to the outdoors. Um, and, and right now it's been the urban outdoors, um, and you know, the importance of accessing that green space and, and, um, having that connection to nature, um, which is of course how we get people to care about the natural environment and achieve that sustainability. Um, so again, thank you very much for your time today. Um, All right. and uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you again to Janae for taking the time to talk with me today. If you're interested in learning more about therapeutic recreation, please check out the links in the comment section below.